John Garcia, how are you, my friend? Welcome into the game in T-Town. I'm doing well, Ryan. How about that refreshed Ryan voice? I like it. You know, in, in this business, you know, you, you got to get those batteries recharged. I mean, you know you know what I mean? I mean, you got to get them. You know, you, you can get a couple of days off and you get a little bit, but, man, you got to take a little bit of time and just get away and let your mind kind of reset stuff, too. You do. You do because you can you – you end up working – some every day and obviously some days a ton more than others so no, i feel you i feel you and this is the window to do it early in camp maybe if you have to go during the season you go late in the year maybe cupcake weekend when it's not the stakes aren't as high so you have to be very strategic in this business but it seems like every time you take a trip or you try to plan one you you, you get that little bit of worry that something may happen so i hope I hope you you've grown beyond that. Myself. Well, and and I, I'll say this: I'm I'm sitting at practice uh, on that Saturday, and I'm going down to the media availability. And uh, Marquise went one way, and I went the other. He he grabbed Jalen, and I grabbed two, and we grabbed Christian Miller and a bunch of other stuff. And then we compare notes, and we're going, "Oh my heavens!" And and John, I did not have a chance to talk with you last week. I'm just curious from from your perspective, what what did you think of what Jalen said? You know, I thought he was he was waiting to say something like this. It seemed like um, it was it was very much planned, and I guess Nick Saban asked him that he he really wanted to put out a, a certain message. Now, I, I think that message got taken multiple directions by by those of us who look at it. I, I think he was really focused on the past in an effort to reestablish the present, um, um, but. The way he went about that certainly rubbed some people the wrong way and, and probably brought him some unfair, undeserved criticism. I think he's been as scrutinized a player at Alabama that, that I've ever seen, um, especially after just two years. Um, and I think he's, he's kind of – he wore a little bit, it felt like. He wore it um, with the media, um, almost like, you know, they, they say you should let things out because you don't want it to build up, and it seems like – a lot had built up uh, with, with Jalen Hurts, and, and he got it off his chest. And I, I kind of think, given what we know about him most other days, that's kind of who he is. If, if something comes out, that's kind of it. And I, I expect that to be how he approaches it and how Alabama approaches it going forward. I expect that to be kind of the last we'll hear of pre-2018 fall camp. Um, and I think everybody else will kind of just move on. And I think that's probably what we should do too. But um, – I would be lying to you if I said I, I wasn't pretty surprised to hear anything close to what he actually said. But, John, going back here just for a couple of minutes, is there any chance, because we've all read the, the stats, even though they were not, quote, officially released by Alabama, Jalen didn't have a good scrimmage. Uh, matter of fact, it was probably one of his worst scrimmages. And it's a very important scrimmage because that one is really close to the majority of the public. This one coming up on Saturday is open to the Red Elephant Club members. Now, that opens it up to a lot of different people. Uh, it's also the A-Club scrimmage. So, news is going to flow quite uh, rapidly out of Bryant and he's steady on Saturday. Uh, is there any chance that some of the frustration that he showed was because Tua was, was pulling ahead? He knows it's going to be very difficult for him to win this job. I think that's human nature, sure. um, and I think that has to be a part of it. Um, look, the the facts say, no matter what led up to it, halftime of that game in Atlanta, he got pulled for Tua, and he has, at that point, and, and ever since, been looking up to Tua in some regard, certainly from perception, but as fact, you know, he played what? He had the one snap to, to position – Papanastas there at the end of regulation, but before the missed field goal, and that was kind of it. So um, if you go based on fact, it's, I don't know, 50 to one uh, since halftime. And, and that is always going to stick with him. That perception is going to stick with him all the way through. And if, if you don't think that factors in, I, I just think you're kind of against human nature. That has to be in the back of his mind. And that's when mistakes typically happen. You know, you always, you always hear coaches and, and it doesn't even, it's not just sports. It's really in, in anything where there's pressure, you're, you're always told or you see people get told, hey, be yourself, just do you, don't worry about all the other things. But that, the reason that message is so consistent is because it's so easy to worry about and think about so many other things. And, and I would have to imagine that every time Jalen's spinning the ball, wearing crimson and white or, or black as, as the quarterbacks wear often, 
Um, he's he's got to be worried about being as good and as perfect as he can, which is something you you always want your quarterback to do anyway. But it's it's different. It's a different feel. There's there's something looming over you at all times, and and I think overcompensation seems like from what we hear um, was was perhaps a part of this, and and it was not a good day. Um, and that's something that we we've, we've heard a little bit here and there um, more recently. So I would just wonder how much that's in the back of his mind every single time he's, you know, thinking about the play, thinking about his steps, thinking about the delivery, thinking about the accuracy, just every single element of, of the game's hardest position. And it seems like it, we're hearing that more than maybe we all thought we would hear about his inconsistencies and even, even turning the ball over, which is really the most uncharacteristic thing of all uh, with Jalen. That was really his, his kind of saving grace and the reason why a lot of people thought he had a shot at this thing uh, and he still may but but obviously turning the football over uh, doesn't help any quarterback so john let's go back here because what saturday told me and i'm just reading between the the tea leaves here what, what it told me is they're forcing him to stay in the pocket they want him to throw the football and now where he was a little bit conservative last year they're saying throw the football that that's why you to me you saw the numbers increase on the int they're forcing him where he was running and being secure. Either he knows that he's got to throw the football or they're telling him, you've got to throw the football. There is somebody open in those routes. You've got to find them, and you've got to throw the football. You've got to take those chances. And to me, that's not who Jalen is as a player. I don't know if you could force him to be something he's not. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I also think in, in – Obviously, a scrimmage is a little bit of a different setting, but in practice settings in general, you know, quarterbacks don't throw the ball away. They're they're encouraged, uh, like you said, to put the ball in play, uh, whether it's one on one, seven on seven, team drills, even scrimmage like scenarios. You know, throwing the ball away doesn't really do anybody any good. Um, obviously, in the game, given the down and distance and situation, you play to that and you you kind of accept that, but that's never the goal and, and obviously in practice in these scenarios you're working towards the goal which is converting uh first downs and obviously scoring touchdowns so um i would imagine it would be encouraged for him to put the ball in play almost no matter what and maybe that's already been emphasized throughout the first however many days and weeks of camp to where he's already doing that on his own uh, and i think you know independent of looking at tua um that's something that that he knows he needed to improve on. It was very clear why he was pulled in the Georgia game. I'm sure Nick was pretty clear to him, just like he was to the media. Um, I'm, it, it's really not hard to figure out in terms of that day. So that has to be with him at all times. And, and part of getting out of that was taking the chances that he surely did not even think about taking uh, in that first half against Georgia. John, what are, what are your expectations of Savion Smith, Trayvon Diggs, uh, other – uh, guys at that corner spot, just the entire defensive group as far as defensive back group. What are your expectations for these guys going into the 2018 season? I think it's a group that that'll be challenged um, and, and rightfully so there's minimal experience with, with these guys, um, even a Trevon Dick who's played a good bit, but never really solidified himself. It feels like um, at any one spot. So consistency there is is something that I expect him to be challenged with. Sevian Smith hasn't played SEC ball in two years. He's going to be challenged early and often, and that's that's kind of what I'm looking at. If I'm Louisville, that's that's where I want to attack at least early. Find out if these guys are ready because um, you know it, it's not like you're in the trenches or a quarterback or a running back where where you you'll have a ton of contact and you'll be in the mush to to figure out if you're ready for the game or not or to wake yourself up what have you, but I mean, those guys on the Island, um, you know, when the first ball comes your way, you'll know that that's your form of, of first contact. So I think um, they have all the talent. There's, there's no doubt about it, but they will be challenged early and off. And I, I think of a lot of the freshman DBs we've seen play at Alabama over the years and, and how they are always attacked. I remember, um, you know, Eddie Jackson playing corner against Ole Miss getting attacked back shoulder. I remember, you know, Tony Brown getting attacked back shoulder uh, as a freshman early in, in his career. Even Marlon Humphrey is a redshirt freshman. It's just what has to happen. Those guys 
need to be in that fire. And I think Louisville will at least try to take advantage of it uh, with a receiving core. That, that is good on paper. Now, what they've said verbally over the last few days probably doesn't help them much. But we know it's a confident group, and we know that, that Jawan Pass, Louisville's new quarterback, much more of a pocket guy, or I would say much more of a full-time pocket guy compared to, to Lamar Jackson, who he's replacing. So um, Louisville's going to have to throw the football if they want to win this game, if they want to be in the game. And I think um, those guys are going to be challenged immediately. Uh, they have the talent, but, again, um, everything's a little bit different once once the, the bullets are live. But, but all indication is that these guys have all collectively played well. And I think um, maybe that starting cornerback question is further along in towards getting an answer than, than any other true battle that's gone on. I think right tackle still up for debate. I think safety could be up for debate star maybe, but I think those two corners have all but solidified themselves on the outside with, with Diggs and Smith. So uh, for Diggs, you give him kudos for putting it all together and obviously showing some consistently. And for Smith, uh, you give him the nod for being able to come to a third program in as many years and make uh, just as, as important and as, uh, soon or immediate of, of an impact. Let me ask you, when you look at Patrick Sertain, he passes the eye test. I think it's everything that you described in, in, in throughout the process. But I think one of the things that I've heard from some that's uh, inside the program is you got to, you also got to kind of put your nose in there and get a little bit dirty. You, you cannot avoid the contact. You got to, you know, you, you got to hit that guy. You got to make sure that you get there first and, uh, deliver the contact uh, early on. Do you just try to avoid that? Is that just something that you're trying to get used to? Cause you've, you've got the skill set. Uh, he's just got to get his nose in there and get a little bit dirty at times. Yeah. You know, I, I think th- th- those situations are, are where you kind of look at the nature of the game and how it's flowed with contact and, and defensive backs in particular have really been, it's almost like, yeah, you're taught to tackle, but you're also taught how to not get penalties. So you wonder how much that, um, you know, penalty for aggression, uh, the repercussions of that have, have affected defensive backs coming downhill. Now, when you're talking run support, um, that's a whole different ballgame. And, and that's what um, I'm talking about. I'm something sorry. You need to, yeah. yeah, it's something you need to be able to do. Um, and I think that that's a Nick Saban thing. You know, there's a lot of programs, high school, college, even NFL, that really don't rely on their corners much for run support. But um, it is pretty much black and white that it is a big big reason that uh, kids play early at Alabama they have to be able to come up and support the run and when you're you're labeled as a shutdown corner for basically your entire life there are a lot of games that go by where you really don't see any type of action and that is the ultimate respect and compliment to you but conversely that's you know the, the lack of reps that you have physically you know uh, compared to, to some, some counterparts. So I think that is something that is really interesting to certain. He's big, strong, fast. We already know that. But putting those things, you know, uh, together uh, in this kind of setting against, you know, Najee Harris, Jamie Harris, these guys, a little bit of a different ball game, and certainly something that, that he's never experienced uh, in the slightest. So, um, you know, if that's what you're hearing, then there could be a little bit of reasoning there, but uh, it sure, certainly shouldn't be looked at uh, as an excuse. I think, uh, you know, uh, it's big boy football. You don't come to Alabama to shy away from contact. So maybe maybe it's more of a technical thing and a repetition thing that, that you give the kid the benefit of the doubt for, at, at least this early. Hey, we're, we're only eight days in the camp, man. I mean, you know you, you know what I mean? I mean, at some point, <laughs> and you, you look, and, and sometimes, and this happens a lot, is when you're so good, you got to find something that that you got to work on, right? I, I mean, you know, it's uh, I can only imagine. You, Nick Saban was talking about he didn't even want to say the guy's name of wide receiver on Saturday. Well, I think we all know who he's talking about. It, it's Jalen Waddle. Uh, but it, 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 you got to find somewhere to critique him. And and I guess you, uh, Jalen Waddle, man. I mean, it, it, if I had a dollar for every time this guy's name was mentioned behind the scenes, I'm sure you, you're the same way. Uh, I, I'd have enough to go get a nice little ribeye. Yeah, you know that's and that's something we've been hearing since since last summer. You know, I my, the most telling thing in my mind when I hear Jalen Waddle is a source in Tuscaloosa at at camp said not only was he the most explosive player at the camp last year, but he might have been the most explosive player ever to come through Alabama camp. Now that is a ridiculous statement because for every blue chip recruit that goes to Bama camp 
gets the offer and commits, there's two to three who are just as good who come to camp, get the work, and, and end up elsewhere. So you're talking about not only um, kids who ended up at Alabama, but kids who ended up at you know uh, Georgia and Ohio State and USC and whatever. Um, that's when you start to you say, okay, this kid is freaky good. And we, we saw it at the Army All-American Bowl, um, and we, we've seen it every time we've seen him. Um, and it's, it's like you get over the, the slight of frame excuse that you give to him. Well, he's a smaller guy. You know, that's kind of the knock. And, and I think that it makes you hesitant with him overall. But, I mean, it gets to the point with Jalen Waddle where you hear so much of it on the other side that you have to kind of stop ignoring it, regardless of, of what, you know, height and weight tells you or stereotypes about smaller guys. Regardless of all of that, you have to kind of buy into it at some point. And, I think, um, yeah, the sources and all that, I mean, what more can they say about this kid? It's clear he's going to have some type of role, whether it be supplementary wide receiver, special teams, et cetera. Um, he'll be on the field in some capacity, and he will get some type of touches. I would be borderline floored uh, if that wasn't the case this year. We're talking to John Garcia. You can find him on the Twitter account, at John Garcia underscore junior college football recruiting analyst, we always love to depend on his expertise with playing the game of college football and allowing us to pick his brain for a couple of minutes. It's Crimson and Blue Chips, the podcast. Uh, John, take a couple of minutes to get us up to date with recruiting headlines. I, I know Alabama picks up another commitment uh, earlier this morning with Malachi Moore. Uh, just talk about uh, in, in the world of recruiting. Get us caught up to up to speed. Yeah, big, big week plus for Alabama recruiting. Obviously, it started – Last week with uh, not a conventional recruiting win, but Bama will take it, getting five-star Ale Cajo uh, on board after he was released from Washington at an important position at linebacker. Then Alabama landed a uh, an offensive lineman from Baltimore, Darian Dalcourt. You know, he's, he's an interior guy, probably going to be a center at Alabama, which is something they didn't have on the, cur- on the commitment list to this point. Another blue chip recruit, teammate of current commitment Shane Lee and Alabama freshman, Ayabi Anoma at St. Francis Academy, which is becoming a nice pipeline to Alabama. And then obviously a basketball commitment. Um, you know, Bama gets a five-star instater for Avery Johnson. So that's technically recruiting uh, with, with Kyra Lewis. And then, and then today Malachi Moore in the class of 2020, um, another corner that you just kind of see and, and look at as a Nick Saban type of corner, six foot, 180. Dad is 6'5", played D1 basketball. This kid has great ball skills as a corner, wide receiver, and basketball player. Physical at the line of scrimmage. A little bit of early Marlon Humphrey comparisons for me, although he's not quite the sprinter that Marlon was at the time, and Marlon was a literal track star already at that point. He's not quite there athletically, but height, weight, mentality, confidence, experience, feel, technique, He's, he's kind of on that trajectory, and, and, and he'll be tested a ton this year. First games against a five-star receiver committed to Georgia, but uh, Malachi Moore is a great get, um, long kid at, at a position where that is becoming more and more important as these receivers get bigger, faster, stronger. Everybody wants the guy who could be molded to, to cover a Julio Jones type, and this is the kid who has that type of foundation. And, and again, two years of high school ball, remaining for Malachi Moore. So a big get and yet another at Hewitt Trustful High School. That's four current commitments from Hewitt Trustful, which is the, the school that Brent Key, the offensive line coach and Birmingham area recruiter, graduated from. So uh, he's going back to his home well a few times. And, and hey, who's to say that, that Bama can't get commitment number five from Hewitt at some point o- over the next few months? It's kind of rolling over there with Paul Tyson, Pierce Quick, and those guys. John Garcia, go find him on the Twitter account and go find him now, 24-7 Sports. He just posted an article a few hours ago on that top 100 prospect and Malachi Moore. Uh, Go there. He spent some time with him, and you can read the in-depth article there, 24-7 Sports, and also Crimson and Blue Chips podcast uh, just in time, as he said earlier today, for another Alabama football commitment. John Garcia, I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, sir. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me on, Ryan.